Hello everybody up there, it's welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show brought to you aboard High Sea Drifter on my own I'm fishing just a general ordinary days fishing bit of an experiment I'm out here about I guess I'm about three miles off the shore over there I'm gonna turn it around Isle of Wight in the distance way in the distance I have unfortunately got a northerly wind which is coming sideways on to a ebb tide going to the west so it's pushing me from the mark where I want to be there's a very small wreck showing on the uh, GPS it's probably, look, just a toilet system or something like that, I don't know. But I, I was circling around there waiting for Trawler to finish putting his pots out or whatever he was doing because I didn't want to get my anchor in his gear. And a uh, big shoal of fish marked. I don't know what they were and I wasn't sure if that was actually the wreck. I couldn't find them again so I've anchored in where I think is the right place but I've got a feeling that the, this, this wind has pushed me off. But first drop down with small hooks, I got jumbo pouting like you wouldn't believe the first rod down bam 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 they were on so i know pouting like living near wrecks also living near wrecks are conger eels they live right inside them my target species is i have to say a conger eel i'll settle like you do when you go fishing like this for pretty much anything i'm not really bothered but what i have got to show you is i've been catching these pouting i must have had eight or ten now on chunks of rainbow trout now I've used this before, it's really good bait. So I've got the pouting up and I've got jumbo ones. Let me show them to you. There they are, look, really, really big pouting. I've been cutting fillets off of that one to drop it down. And on the big rods, I've got, I did start with mackerel there and I've got some sand eels. I've been catching on sand eels as well, but they love that trout. Or they did when I was, before I got blown off the wreck by this wind. So these big rods here, let me just show you. These big rods here, one, two, three, four, I've got whole pouting on them either skeletons or split tails, whole jumbo pouting, in the hope that something big can smell them. I figure if there's all those shoals of pouting around, there will be predators, well, somewhere in the area, one hopes. Here, this rod I've got up here is an up tidal with a grip lead, cast that way with a fillet of pouting, and here, way up there, up on the top floor, top deck as it were, is another rod that's, I called it up tidy, but it's lobbed out there, you can see by them. It's only got four ounce lead on it, it tells you not a great deal of tide. So, that is my initial target species, but I would like something big to come along and eat it. Now, this is what I've been using here, people. I'll put it up then I can show you actually. They're chunks of rainbow trout. I've caught on this before, and you can see they're lovely. These have still got ice in them, still frozen up lovely pink chunks i've cut up a fillet of uh, rainbow trout lovely big chunks now you can cut that in half and use it again they're so tough the skin here you only need to nick once but the beauty of it is they can chew the meat off but they're still going to get a bit of skin there so it's a very very durable bait almost as good as cuttlefish they're very very tough and you can refreeze those as well it doesn't seem to matter i think actually the oil in them because they're fed on oil-based pellets the trout don't forget i think that maybe helps preserve that meat i don't know I really don't I just know that the pouting have been taking that. I've had a couple on sand, but mostly on that. So I'm going to drop down now, see if I can't catch you guys a fresh pouting. There's my sand eels in there. Right. I'm going to get this rod, rod baited up and get it back down there. Okay, I'm using for catching the pouting a light rod, just this white spinning rod. It's called a Kanji 40 to 80 grams. You can see the casting weight, 2.40. A fixed ball reel which is spinning wheel. It is Takashima. It's a top we've had those before. It's got quite a high um, retrieve ratio, 5.5 to 1. Um, got 15 pound Andy premium line on there and I'm just using just like this. Look, hopefully you can see that guys. Just a straight pattern oster. One hook through the trout, that's all it takes a lead at the bottom and this you can actually let go down quite quickly because the lead's going down first it's not going to spin up just going to cast it out a little way and see if we can't get a fish so this one you see you can uh, you can let it go down quite quickly because the lead's going down first and it tows it down but make sure if you're a beginner that you're absolutely sure you've hit the seabed. If you don't, you run the risk of having your bait way up in the water above where the fish are. 
Now I just hit the bottom there. I wind down and I lift it once and then I, I wait and drop it, bang. I can feel the lead hit the seabed. There, that's on the seabed. Then all you got to do is check your drag. Don't want too much, don't want too little. You can either hold the rod like this and put the line across your finger. See, just like this, feeling for bites. Or just watch the rod top. Or indeed, put in a rub vest and chill out. The water is really warm. It's November in a few days. But look at the clouds up there. Now that's like cirrus cloud. You can tell the wind's high up there. So I'm figuring at some stage, maybe say 48 hours away, you're going to get some wind. We call them mare's tails. So it's beautiful sky, cold. There's ice on the windscreen this morning. But beautiful sky up there. Look, it's just nice to be out here. Now I'm going to have another throw, but I'm going to go way, way across the tide over there. This northerly wind has pushed me off the area where the wreck is, so I'm just going further back and see if my hunch is right. I don't really want to re-anchor if I can help it. I'll probably have to put the GPS on and uh, see where I've moved to. So initially when I stopped, man alive, the powder were going crazy. Now that's on the bottom. Close it. Bump it. Just bump it. So you'll, you'll, you'll get used to it. The more you do it, the more you'll bump it. But if you're beginners, you definitely want to make sure every now and then that your lead is holding the bait on the bottom, on the seabed. On these big rods, I've got one, two, three, four jumbo pouting or carcasses of pouting. Nothing yet, but I figure with all the pouting I was catching and seeing, I guess on the sounder that there's got to be some other fish around. Unless it's just pouting, in which case that might be quite boring. From what I've heard on the radio, it's been a little bit quiet. The other boats, not many out, it's midweek. But of course, you've got to take this weather slot when you can. It's no good saying the cod, the cod fishing's great in two weeks' time. Yeah, but you might not have the weather in two weeks' time. Just as a guide on the sounder, that's where I am on that little contour, that drop-off there. And there, now it's coming up, wreck, just there. Now, this big cloud of bait I saw was about there, even further, about here. So I thought the, the wind has pushed me off, there's north, it hasn't actually pushed, pushed me off, I'm, I'm pretty much in a line with that, so I think with the westerly flow going this way, you can see it's north upwards up there, I think I'm just going to have to tough it out here. Maybe it's a state of tide, and... You know, I got fish at a certain state of tide and now it's fading off, I won't get the fish. I think, now I've seen, I switched it back on, I've seen how close I am to the wreck there, showing up wreck. I think I might just as well stay where I am. Obviously nothing showing on the sounder there. Well, I'm kind of paranoid, absolutely paranoid, about making sure that my bait and my lead is absolutely on the seabed. Here in the UK, because we have a lot of following around the world, we don't get really a lot of fish up in the water. You've got to have your bait on the seabed. It's where most of the fish are going to be swimming. So I'm constantly lifting and raising the rod, trying to induce a bite and to ensure that my bait is in the right spot. Indeed, in this white rod I've got here, the good old kanji is doing its magic again. I'm hooked up. And the best thing about it is, with Rainbow Trout as bait, it's kind of weird because you don't know what's going to grab that. I mean, there's no way in the world that this dogfish has ever seen or would likely to be seen with a piece of trout, rainbow trout in his mouth. It shows you what a great bait it can be. I've used it in loads. I've had tobe, conger, bullhus, everything that likes to hunt by smell and scent loves a good old chunk. And look how tough that skin is. It can be chewed and there's still even a little bit left on that one. Skin and meat. I just cut that, that, that trout skin off because the skin is so tough, it's ridiculous. Let's try a piece of sandal to see the contrast in the two. I also like to cast away from the boat, either out to the side, and of course if I cast down tide, I'm gonna be in my chum slip, which should be you know, bits and pieces I drop over the side of the boat. I can flick over extra pieces I've cut off. I don't waste anything. I like to get it in the water. It could be a chum slick with either 
a, you know, a bunch of fish guts inside a mesh bag, or it can even be bits and pieces just flicked over. Now, the best thing to do is, if you do get an excess of bait left over and you wanna use those for cut up cubes of chum, try and do it over a slack period of tide or when it's very, very slack on slowing, because that way, all that bait is going down towards the bottom. If you put it all over the side, when the tide's flowing fast, it might not hit the seabed, who knows, for hundreds of yards, by which time the fish will be miles away. And here I am, I'm loaded up on a fish. Trust me, as a 20 to 30 pound boat rod, I don't think this one is a dogfish. For beginners, make sure you don't just turn that handle and grind the reel out. You want to lift up and then wind down the slack, take up the slack as it goes. Here comes a truly monumental ray. This one is an undulate ray, highly predatory, and I can't remember because I made the film myself, but I think you'll find this is on a pouting that I caught earlier on in the day. the tangle there guys because I think I'll get the fish it's a nice big under it ray Are you guys checking this and look at the whole pouting he took man that's a big undulate oh undulate rays are highly predatory and to me they actually have more of an extendable mouth coming out than a normal ray like a thornback that's just me making an observation uh, maybe they have different you know uh, scent uh, glands and stuff in their noses or around the edge of their skin and they actually can bite these pliers. They crunch on the pliers. Do not get your fingers in there while putting those pliers. So I get the hook out of this one quite easily. But just be aware, they might look like they're gentle jaws. No, they're not. They crush up their food using those sort of molars they got in the front, those big jaws. A great fish to catch though. You can see the skin there on the side of the trout. I can just go through it. Oh, it's hard, it's so tough. Just go through there once. I feel if you do it twice, oh, God, it's tight. If you do it twice, it will bury in the other side. Let's get this one out there, see if we can't get, after that undulate, a bit of fresh bait. Definitely the tide seems to be dying, and I have to go through this way. You go out over there. This is a bizarre and peculiar and unusual place. just gone around the other way whole pouting I felt uh, something tugging at it I've no idea I've got to let him eat it because my hook is right up the front end so I've got to let him turn it it could be a dogfish but I don't think so keep stopping and starting he's trying to eat it there he goes just let him take it like this I can feel him tapping banging trying to turn it it's risky with a big bait, losing the fish, unless it's a big fish. He's still there, boys. Shall I load up on him? When you sat there for like an hour and three quarters for nothing, striking early really is an option you don't sort of want. I think he's dropped it, I think he's dropped it. But it was a decent fish, I don't, think, I don't see it being a doggy. 
Got to creep up on him slowly. Yeah, I don't feel anything. But listen, the tide's just started to move, and that is literally, I've swung right round the other way. Now he's dropped it. Maybe it was just a doggy. Well, we're going to leave it back down there and take a gamble that the bait's still there. That's all you can do. Some people wind up straight away. I just like to leave it a little bit longer, just in case he comes back to it. And that one's pulling a little bit, but I don't think that one is a fish. I'm going to have a clip here. Well, I did say it's an average day, and I just wanted to go fishing. I haven't gone fishing. Yes, I am fishing, but I'm not catching too much. Loads of doggies have actually moved to an area here now of fast tide, because there was no tide up there at all. My mate Wayne's on the outside, sort of, I don't know, about four miles away, five miles away. He said it's a shocker as well. It's just one of those days, the rodeo's been pretty dead. So probably lucky getting that uh, double figure under that. And I've got some dogs, so, you know, pouting. What can I say? I've got one, two, three big baits down there, three big powder, I'm not putting any more lines out. It's screaming here, you can see. So I'm just gonna see my time out because I've got to get the anchor up and it's always a problem on your own. So thank God, hopefully I can get this out. And I'll notice again, up this way, there was a, a wreck. I've gone looking for it, but I can't find it. Probably just as well, because it only made me fish late. So there you go, that's just an average day out, the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. We catch fish as best we can, but when conditions are against you and nobody really knows why the fish aren't on the bite today, I should give it about barely one hour because it gets dark early and I've got to get, now I'm even three miles away further than I was. So I've got about seven miles to get up and get up the creek and all that business and load the boat and drive home for another one and a half hours. But anyway, I'm gonna to tough it out. Just have that last hour, you always live in hope, don't you? All anglers set out with high expectations, absolutely full of hope, in the misguided belief that the fish are going to throw themselves onto the hook. Here's a short trip I did after just two solid days shark fishing alone in my boat, sleeping in the luxurious accommodation of my car. Plus, add to that that the weather was on a change, not for the better, for the worse. Was this going to prove to be? A trip too far. Well, welcome to the Tony Awesome Fishing Show. I'm out here on the south coast of the UK, just trying a real quick film. I'm going to tow my boat back home, and I thought, you know, what, I could get three or four hours here because the weather's on the change. Yes, it's blowing up. It's about possibly a two or three at the moment. Don't need much more. I'm anchored over a really snaggy, reefy area. And have a little competition because I've got my old shark rods and some bottom fishing rods and I've got some mackerel from yesterday, a bit of white as well. I'm going to try and use a rig that I devised some years ago. It's called the cling rig and that is because you can drop one terminal down, gear down and you can catch either conger or ling. I've actually once in Ireland caught a conger on one on the bottom and ling on the other. 
Now, for those who don't know, the conger eel, a big, powerful fish, lives and hunts along the bottom of the seabed, so therefore you've got to catch it with the bait hard on the bottom. It's a reef, it's snaggy, it's a bit like guys fishing for groupers, bang. They're in, as soon as you hook them, they're going to be in a hole, a cave, a crevice, behind a rock, in a piece of wreck, or whatever. The ling, however, although he's really a sort of bottom feeding fish, is predatory, highly predatory with a lot of teeth. It swims just above it. I, I, I don't go down there, but I just know from when I've hooked them. About three feet off the bottom to a little bit further up. Off wrecks, sometimes they will swim up and grab a lure or indeed a bait that's being wound up. They will take baits on the bottom, but I, I always feel you have a better chance for a ling if you've got a bait suspended. So. I devised a, a rig, yes, it's made out of coat hanger wire. Hopefully I can show it to you, you'll understand it. Basically you drop your lead down to the bottom as per normal. I'm gonna do it this way, if you can see this. I've got a running ledger here, on the bottom, here, this one. I've got a half a mackerel tail on there, just there. So that's a normal running ledger, but up here, as I lower this to the seabed, like this, I'm going to go down, 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 bang, the lead hits the seabed. I've got this big coat hanger boom there, hopefully you can see this guys. So I've made up, double twisted it, put a swivel into the end, I tie my main line to one end here, and that running ledger rig for the conga on the bottom line, and then I've suspended here, at just about 18 inches or so, so it is off the bottom, a mackerel head. Now Ling, I love mackerel heads. Don't ask me why. They can't keep going around saying, I'm not in the whole mackerel, I think I'll have just a head today. Oh, pretty full. They'll eat anything, obviously, Will, but they like mackerel heads. So I'm going to drop this down, I'm going to try and rig two of these up, and fish a couple of re regular conga rods, I've already dropped two down on the running ledger rig, and we'll just see if we can't. See, it's like Ling versus conga, or maybe I get lucky and get both on this rig. It's called, there, the Kling rig. I've got a feeling it's a one-way ticket, it's so rough this ground, unbelievably reefy. The camera guys has got to stay in there because this wind is picking up all the time. And I probably might only get an hour or two fishing here, who knows. I mean they did forecast this, but unfortunately you know what forecasts are. Sometimes they're wrong, <laughs> no I think sometimes they're right. Got a black crowd across the back, and there's been a lot of uh, drizzle and low cloud there. We've had a fantastic summer, but I've got a feeling this has just broke the back of it and it's on the chain. So I'm just trying to squeeze out the last two or three hours here. Tidal situation, I'm not really sure about. I've got it down as flooding, and yet it appears to be going that way. I'm on the bottom. I'm gonna lose gear, I know I'm gonna lose gear. But I've got a couple of those clean rigs. I'm gonna rig another one up, put them down, the important thing with the clean rig is to keep tight to the lead. So you're not having it all laying all over the bottom, although it sort of defeats the object. Set this one up in the back rod holder. I've already got a conga rod here, but I've got one just down here. I think I'll rig the other, I think I'll rig the other clean rig up on this one. Just regular boat gear. I was out shark fishing yesterday, got one about 100 pounds. I've come so far from where 250 miles to tow, I feel if I can squeeze another little bit out of it, I will do. I was going to leave my boat up on the uh, north coast. I was going to leave it on a, on a farm up there and then I could fish there. But to be honest, you know, it's such a bomb site, this boat at the moment. After two days shark fishing, it gets pretty rank. And yes, my luxury hotel was indeed the car for the third night in a row. I had steak and alpine in the pub. I don't know, it just didn't want to go down and stay down. Right, let's get this other rod rigged up. Well, the second rig is ready to drop down. It has the most unsavory items as a rotten mackerel half or three quarter section here. There's my boom. See the coat hanger boom there? And on the bottom, how can they refuse an absolutely rank four day old whiting head? I mean, yuck. The best place for this is in the water, I can assure you. 
all experiment, well it's not an experiment, I've used it before. But just try to hold out, hope the anchor holds. I'm on a grapnel anchor guys. It's over a reef, I'm not prepared to put my sand anchor down. I'm gonna call this Bruce, I don't wanna lose that. I'm probably gonna lose some gear at some stage here through the uh, next couple of hours. A load of rain coming, glad I got these baits down. I don't need a fish in the next 20 minutes, really. I think it's time to grub. And you'll hear the banging at the front where the, where the waves come up under those cathedral tunnels and that's why I can't sleep on the boat. Drive you mad. Imagine that noise for six hours through the night. And you, you fished hard all day, you want some sleep. So, the car is the only place. Well, I suppose a hotel would be nice. Well, I've got four baits down there. You can see by the waves and the pounding on the hull here that uh, it's pretty lumpy. It's not like a big swell, it's coming off the uh, land, it's a northwester. If it went westerly, it'd be nice, but no, it just has to have that little bit of north in it that means I get pounded. I think it's time for some breakfast. Right, brekkie time. I'll just keep my cornflakes and any other cereal in here. Just going up the petrol station, buy myself some milk. That's country milk, like skim milk. Don't look at the sugar, it's not going on. Well, no bites yet, guys. What's going to be my problem? You can see the way I'm pitching around like this. My problem is going to be is how long will that rope hold out? It's only, uh, I think, eight or ten mil polyprop, the uh, cheap rope. And if it gets hooked in, so let's say this is a snag, if you can imagine a bowl of cornflakes being a snag, my anchor's in here, the chain is up here, but there could be another rock up here, and my rope's jerking and chafing. Every time the boat goes up and down, it's chafing on a rock in front of the anchor. It could part me out, and the, there's a big reef in here which I really don't need to go through. The problem being, I've got four lines down, so I can't start the engine, really, uh, to get me any steerage until I get the four lines up. Let's just hope I can get a couple of hours out of it. And some breakfast. Well, I didn't have a great night in the car, I've got to tell you guys. I did not have a great night. I think the steak and ale pie I had was made with donkey meat or something like that from Africa. There's a guy way over there. When he saw me come up, he zoomed all the way over here because he thought I was going to see his bass mark. I know there's a tide rip there, I know that's where the bass are, but he thinks, oh my god, that man's going to go right on my spot. I'll move over here and pretend I'm really fishing there. Uh, I've been doing it a long time. And he's now gone back to where he was when I first pulled up. He realises I'm no threat, I'm anchored, and I'm just some idiot that wants to catch a fish that you can't sell, but fights hard. There we go, guys. I've dropped a, a set of shrimp rigs down. I've got a hit on the way down. No mackerel. Absolutely jumbo scat. It's about one of the biggest scat I've caught in the UK. That's called, that's called a horse mackerel or a scad. Really, really good live bait rig for uh, marlin and stuff like that. I don't know what they like to eat. I, I don't know. I, I really don't want that one. You got, you got me there, but they've got a big mouth. Now you can see they eat absolutely anything. This one's going to be kept for bait. But that's a horse mackerel. And I'll have a few more of those as well. Not a seat. Oh, please. There you go, another species. I've had quite a lot of small mackerel. Joey's chucked them back. I guess that's what the guy's over there looking for his bass baits. And there is. I'm calling that. A female cuckoo rest. Check it out, guys. I'm not sure. I think the male has all those bright colours. And that was on tiny little mackerel feathers with a tip of bait, a little tip of squid on there. They're quite a pretty little fish. Hopefully, you can see that one there. I'm not sure the best light for this one there. It's as good as it's going to get, guys. But it's got three black dots on the back. Just here, one, two, three black dots on it. 
Nice little brass. Probably a British record or something. But I don't care, it's going back. No conga as yet. I seem to be picking up um, small mackerel, uh, scad, those horse mackerel I showed you, and I've just had that ras. I've got a chum bag over the side here, left over from shark fishing. Whether that's attracting the fish, I've got to be honest, I don't really know, because they seem quite deep. Let's have another throw, and I'm casting back into the chum slick, letting it sink like this quite fast, so it's dropping vertically. A lot of weed around, that's the annoying part. And I'll just stop it every once in a while, just pop those feathers, just a little jig. And very often, if the, if the fish are down there, they will actually stop the lead. And you think you've hit the bottom, but you must tighten up, otherwise you're gonna get fish and a tangle. And that means wasted fishing time. I just bump it back towards me, like this. I might put another sliver of bait on there. Whether that will attract slightly bigger fish, I don't know. I'm curious to why there's no congas, guys. You can see the slick from my... Uh... Now, I just shook that chum bag just now, and you can see there's a long slick in the distance, but there's also a slick just close to the boat. That's literally where I uh, shook the bag. In fact, I'll do it again. It's all got to go. I'm not taking it home with me. Much as I'd like to. Nothing that time. So I'm going to cast back there in that chum slick again. Because I know very often mackerel will come in and eat those particles of chum. You can see the oil popping on the surface there too. Ah, that felt like fish, right in the chum slick. Right in the chum slick. 20, 30 feet down, and there you go, that's what I've been catching. Small, small joey mackerel. Everything's got a bit of a size limit to it, so you just hold the hook sometimes when you come off, and they shake off. Wow, that one went like a missile. There he goes. Hopefully, number three. Here he goes as well. Bye. See you when you're bigger. You won't get the same treatment. You'll go back all right, but it'll have a hook in it. Probably a shark hook. Out again. So you can do this while you're waiting for conga, guys. I've got my ba big baits on the bottom. Fresh mackerel, big chunks. Nothing. Very peculiar. Meanwhile, I'm amusing myself with a light rod. We'll mind some more of those big scad. Well hang on guys, this could go from a big fish catching exercise to a fun filled small fish exercise because I'm getting tiny bites right on the bottom and I've got, oh yeah, cuckoo wrasse. A cuckoo wrasse has come up too fast. A bug-eyed cuckoo wrasse. Turn it around and show them to you. I think the other one with the orange and the black, three black dots on the tail was a female. I think this is the male one. But we put this one back and he'll probably decompress. There he goes. He's gone. There's another boat over there going on Orkney. I don't know if he's anchoring or drifting. I just tipped it with a tiny piece of mackerel skin. I lob it out just beyond my conga rods. Let it sink to the bottom. Sometimes the fish will take it on the way down. I just stop it every now and then to give it a jig because you can get uh, pollock here as well. They tell me the pollock fish has been really bad down the south coast, apparently, that's what they're saying. And then nobody knows why, as with all secrets. I saw a massive pod of dolphins go past out to the deep 200 foot mark out there. They were hauling, man. They were absolutely, they weren't chasing, they were on a mission. And they came from up the inside here somewhere. Come up from in there. I guess it was that uh, Estuary River. Six three. We better have that one. Not that's going to bother me, but I'll be gone hopefully by the time anything nasty comes. 
The other thing, if you're fishing baited feathers on the bottom, just let the lead touch. Don't let it go slack because your mackerel feathers will snag in the rocks and you'll lose the lot. So a question of just keeping in touch with the bottom and just lifting it and bumping it every now and then till you feel some bites. Braid is good, but put a nylon top shot on so that should you get snagged, you don't cut your fingers pulling out, hopefully. Wrap it around a stick or something to break it out. Put, say, 20 pound line, which is what I've got 20 pound on there. No more bites from the little fish. Well, the small fish keep coming, guys. And then, oh wow, look at this one. A joey mackerel. Put him on that side against the, the, the landscape. You can see it. a joey mackerel, and look. A gurnard. Either it's a small tub or just a red gurnard. Uh, two fish there. I mean, there's better light there. You see a bit of fun fish, but look how small those hooks are on tiny strips of mackerel. Mackerel can go back as can Mr. Gurnard. But you can see, little, just tipping that with a piece of mackerel gives them something to bite on. And that is not the unhappiest fish I've ever seen. He's pretty, isn't he? That is a pretty little chappy. So I must have hooked this one on the bottom and probably the mackerel on the way up. Back you go. Fresh baits required. All I'm doing is taking little strips, tiny little strips of bait like this, really small. Just what we call for tipping, tipping hooks. It just gives them a little bit of a taste of fresh meat because pull that many fish on these uh, small hooks. I think again, but there's no rubber left on them. There's no, uh, there's no lure. So effectively, I'm fishing. Could do with another hook here, really. They're actually okay. I'll send those down again. There we go. Cast it back. If I don't get hit on the way down, a couple of jigs just to pause it. I'm not even sure you jig it, I think you just pause it to be honest. I don't think I must be on rough ground because the sounder is uh, marking it really rough. But unusual to get that red gurnard. Generally, he's over more sand or broken ground. So maybe that's why I'm not getting conga, who knows. It might be a ling hunting there. Now I'm on the bottom. A little bit of a loop there. And I'm just gonna basically just tighten up to those small hooks. So it's just, I could just feel the lead just bumping on the bottom. Another thing you can get on these big boats, on these big rods, are bull hus. They like heads, mackerel heads as well. In fact, really, there's not much uh, in the big fish world that would turn down a nice mackerel head. And I just raise it and bump it every now and then just to give it a bit of movement. And also, because I've cast back there, I'm bumping it towards me. I'm covering a little bit of different ground all the time. Well, I've had quite a few bites straight under the boat, and I've been getting quite a few of these uh, these really pretty wrasse here, look. So all you wrasse experts out there, female cuckoo wrasse, yes or no? Is it a gold sinny? It's not the cork queen, I don't think, is it? Pretty colours in it though, very pretty. Should be in an aquarium, and you can see those little teeth there shredding that piece of mackerel. Let's unhook him, get him back, or her. I think it's a female cuckoo wrasse, guys. Here, well, you, you guys tell me. Got a blue tinge to the top of its fin, but three distinctive dots on that black tail. Yeah, what's happening here is that gurnard was the pointer that I'm not really on the hardest of snaggiest of rough ground. I think that's why I haven't had the conga. I'm going to give it another 10 or 15 minutes here and I might move just 50 or 100 feet closer to the shore where I know there's some rock. My other problem is the tide's dying a lot sooner than it should do because these are what's called neap tides. There's very, very small movement in them. There's not a lot of flow. So consequently, with small neap tides, it means there's not much water movement, not volume of water moving. It's a small rise and fall of tide. 
so there's virtually no current my lines are straight up and down there's no current to take the smell off the bait always better with a bit of flow going i'll probably stick it out for another 15 20 minutes here and then i'm going to try and move in shore a little bit see if i can find rough, rougher ground and on the braid i can actually feel the lead is hitting like a little i want to call it a puff of sand or shingle it's definitely not clonk hard rock and that's what i need for the cogger and the ling so although I'm catching a, scratching a few fish out on the small rod, um, with this lack of tide, coupled with the fact I might just be swinging off the wrong ground, I might go for a re-anchoring. That's the theory anyway. Listen, we all need excuses, don't we? I'm pretty sure that's what it is. I'm not on the right ground. When a fishing does get a bit slow, what you can do very often, I mean, I've already got this, you see this polyprop on, uh, that's right, an old cut down garden hose room, so I can wind it up and store it in the front cuddy up there. You can, to try a little bit of different ground, just slack back on the anchor rope and just let it resettle in a different area. You might put another 20, 30 feet out and those fish could be 20, 30 feet away. I'm going to do that rather than re-anchor. The important thing to do is make sure you wound all your leads, don't necessarily into the boat, but just you wound them up a little bit, just lift those leads up a little bit so as you drift back with them drag and snag in the bottom. Yes, it's still breezy. Well, I will say it's constant. Well, some pressure on that. Simple matter just to drop them back down to the bottom. It might do something, it might not. Oh, the last 30 minutes, at least fishing a different bit of ground. It's a bit deeper actually. Establish the arsenal of weapons I'm using. I'm down to the 30 minute warning. Well, it's non-stop work on these rats. Straight down the side, not being casted back. Oh, right on the lens. Couldn't do that if I wanted to. I'm trying to keep the camera clean, might go mad. There you go. They're really pretty fish. I'm just catching them one after the other. Just tiny bits of mackerel strip, and I'll find if you wind them up really slowly once you've got the bite, because I've got small barbs on these hooks. I'm gonna get it out now, there you go. If you just wind them up slowly, they can decompress and go down on their own. Got very long nose to it, that one. Well, not that one, this particular species. So you can see the three dots and the black, uh, the blue, just at the very fringe of his tail there. Anyway, it's amusing me, even though there's no conga, and I fear there might not be any conga. I'm not gonna move, I've got about 40 minutes left. I just catch what I catch, that's the way it is. 
and it's French as well. What do we say? Off. Well, I'm finishing up, catching some jumbo mackerel. Look at the size of this one. I'm going to hold his tail. I don't want him splashing the lens. So no conga, no ling. The tide's done to me again. But we'll be back. So thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Look out for Mike's TA Outdoors. Don't forget both channels. Hit that subscribe button. Hit the little bell. That tells you a notification. It tells you when the next film's coming out. I'm going to pull the anchor. Probably have one more drop. Ouch. Look in the finger. I have one more drop. But at least I've got some different species here. And the conga. That cling rig. We'll get them next time. We'll see you on the next trip out.